How should NC State football kick off the second half of their season? Well, you could start by gunning for your first win in ACC play. You are Locked On Wolfpack, your daily podcast on the NC State Wolfpack, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Wolfpack Nation? It's time to get locked in with Locked On. Thanks for making Locked On Wolfpack your first listen each and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Our Friday sponsor is FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Head on over to FanDuel.com in order to get started. Happy Friday to all. As always, I'm Grayson Boone, joined by former Wolfpack defensive tackle Kenton Gibbs. Kenton, NC State welcomes Syracuse down in Carter-Finley, 8 p.m. kickoff Saturday night. It is our blackout game. A lot of, well, I guess somewhat excitement around the new black uniforms. They have the red font instead of the white font. I think that's an upgrade personally, but we're not here to talk about the uniforms. We're here to talk about the football game. We have Kenton's keys, and hopefully they are crucial in beating the Syracuse Orange. Grayson, for lack of a better word, this offense has to make the juice worth the squeeze, all right? In this game, we need to see the offense show up in a major way because I believe that Syracuse's offense is as good as advertised. And with that being said, with the struggles we've had on defense where it just seems to be we just fail these vibe checks. It's just everybody does it right except one guy. I think we're going to need to do something special offensively. So score 35 points is my first key because honestly and truly, I don't see a world where you beat Syracuse without doing that. Yeah, based on the defensive struggles that we've seen NC State have, if you're going to win this game, it's more than likely going to have to be a shootout. You're going to have to keep up with the Syracuse offensive pace. You're probably going to have to air it out a lot more than you have been. And we've been kind of pounding the table for that here for a while. NC State's going to have to find a way to string together multiple successful drives that end in six instead of ending in three. You've got to be able to keep up with Syracuse's pace if you want to have a shot at this one. Not only that, they have not been held under 30 points all season except one time. Every other game, they have put up, you know, massive amounts of offense in terms of 38 against Ohio, 31 against Georgia Tech, 42 against Holy Cross, 44 against Nevada. Oh, I'm sorry, UNLV, rather. You have to, have to, have to score with this team if you're going to win this football game. And there is a caveat to that, which you pointed out yesterday. They haven't exactly faced juggernaut defenses, but NC State's defense is not playing that well right now either. So something's going to have to give here, and more than likely, it's going to have to be the NC State offense leading the way. And our second offensive key? Get Justin Jolie seven or more targets. Granny free. We're happy that she's free. We're happy that she's out the cage. I I was worried about Granny Boone. You know, we, we, I am so excited to have her free because Grayson, while being as good of a host as possible, was still holding Granny in the cage. With that being said, he has scored the touchdown. We got her out. But then let's get more of Justin Jolie. Let's get more of this young man who excels so much when the ball is in his hands. Look for him. Look to feed him. Look to, he is a walking mismatch. Who can keep up with him? If you put a linebacker on him, they're too slow. If you put a DB on him, they're too small. And guess what? If you get it to him in the flat, if you get it to him underneath, he will find ways to break tackles. Get it to Justin Jolie. Target him at least seven times. I did what I had to do. I put Granny in the cage for the sole purpose of getting Justin Jolie in the end zone. We finally made it happen. It was a great moment, and then it was all for naught because we ended up losing the game. Now, what can't get lost here is how effective Justin Jolie is with the football in his hands. Last week, only four targets, but he had four receptions and 73 yards. We've already kind of talked about this before. If he can do that on four targets and four receptions, imagine what he can do with like eight, nine, or 10. He has been our most effective weapon on offense, use him as such. Use him as such. We can't afford to have a guy that dangerous in your offense and only him touch the ball like three or four times. It's nowhere near enough. We've seen all season what he can do, finally got him in the end zone. We need so much more of that, and it needs to start 
Saturday night against Syracuse. We have a head coach that played tight end. We have an offensive <laughs> coordinator who is also the tight end coach. I do not understand how our best weapon at the moment, how our leading receiver at the moment is a tight end and we will not get the ball to him more, but I believe they will in this game. I believe we get it. We understand, hey, this is the path to winning. So give me Justin Jolie winning or, or making things happen offensively here. Because again, tight, former tight end head coach, offensive coordinator who's a tight end coach, you got to, you got to feed your horses, especially the horse that uh, you two have a lot in common with. Granny was so fired up when she saw the reveal video of the new black uniforms and Justin Jolie was in it. In fact, he was even in a cage, ironically enough. She said, ooh wee, JJ's going for two of them things on Saturday night. And I said, Granny, you better make sure I don't find that key to the cage. <laughs> hey, man, Granny out. Granny out. Leave Granny alone, okay? Leave Granny she's, alone. She's free, but we got to keep her out of the cage. Make sure Justin Joe Lee get, has plenty of food on his plate because you already know that man's going to eat. And our third and final offensive key, no more than two targets to KC behind the line of scrimmage. I mean, this is everything in my heart and soul. It's it's the opposite of the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. No. If it is broken, fix the damn thing. It's very broken. It's very broken. At least avoid it. You know, I don't know what type of school system y'all grew up in. But in Detroit Public Schools, if something was broken and they couldn't afford to fix it at the time, the janitor would just put up a sign that said, out of service. We want an out of service sign on the screens and on the jet suite push passes. Out of service. Out of service. I don't want it. Don't want to think about it. Don't want to hear about it. Don't. I want nothing to do with that foolishness. We don't want to hear you say screen no more. Not at <laughs> Enough all. of the screens. We said it earlier this week. Stop the screens. Get KC, if you're going to use him as much as you want to, get him down the field. As simple as a drag route would be fine, or a slant route, or a short crossing route, whatever it is, get him in open space beyond the line of scrimmage. I promise you, that is when he does his best work. There's a very good Fan Friday comment that you'll see in a couple minutes that links to exactly what we're talking about right now. KC's not a secret. You can't hide him in motion. Teams know what he is. If you're going to use him, get him down the field. Do not target him behind the line of scrimmage. We're tired of it. And now switching gears over to defense and special teams. Force three plus Kyle McCord turnovers. Kyle McCord is going to have what I like to call McCord moments. He has those moments where you just look at it and you're just like, what, what did he do? Who was he? How? In what world? You have to capitalize on those. Yeah, I normally say tips and overthrows. We need all of those, but this goes beyond that because Kyle is going to give you one where it's going to land right in your chest. It's going to be right there. He's going to hit you. If you got a single digit, he's going to hit you right on the three. Or he's if you got a double digit, he's going to hit you right between the one and the zero. You just got to hold on to the ball, okay? But even beyond that, on top of that, you will have to make some moments. You will have to make some plays where you do an amazing job of getting to the quarterback to force something. You do an amazing job. But you know what? That actually wasn't a terrible read. You just made a play where it's like, hey, that kid's on scholarship too. He's, he's making some NIL money too. So you have to force three-plus Calvin McCord turnovers because if we are to get to 35, you don't get there with five long field touchdown drives. I really don't see that being the case. So please force three plus turnovers. For a defense and in some senses an offense that is struggling so mightily, you have to be able to capitalize on the other team making mistakes. We were 0 for 2 in that department against Wake Forest. And then you saw, because we lost the game, where capitalizing would have really helped your case. You can't afford to waste those types of opportunities against Kyle McCord and Syracuse. So not only do you have to force pressure and force mistakes and turnovers, but then you got to go down and capitalize on them as well. Our second key for defense and special teams? Hold Syracuse under 35% on third down conversion rate. Here's the deal, right? If you cannot get off the field, you will lose this football game. And actually, I want to make that third and fourth down conversion rate because we saw last game, Fair point. even if you stop them on third, 
there's another down where they're not obligated to punt. So you must stop this team on third and fourth down. You need to put drives to an end. This is so frustrating to see this team get in excellent situations and then on the last moment, right? It's it's like they they must be reading the uh, the Green Lantern Corps uh, oath or something like that in terms of every offense when they see us on on fourth down because it's like oh in blackest day or brightest night we're gonna get this first down it's gonna happen we don't know how NC State's gonna give it up but somehow they're gonna give up this first down we need to get off the field an offense as prolific as Syracuse's will not be able to do much when they're sitting on the bench. That is not how it works. So, you know, you need to hold them to under 35% in terms of third and fourth down conversion rate. Really nothing else I can add to that. You you don't need to give an offense as good as this one any more help than they're already getting. Get off the field and then help your offense in turn. That's all there is to say. And our third and final defensive key. No more than 40 yards of penalties in total. I say that because Syracuse is going to air the ball out. They're going to throw it deep. If you can stop this team, if you can go ahead and force those turnovers, and you cannot have the big penalties that kill you, you'll be just fine. But if you have a bunch of those penalties where it's just like, boy, every time we look up, you're bailing them out with another penalty, we're going to have a really long game. This feels like the first real test for the NC State secondary this season, and Predominantly, it's because we haven't been able to stop the run at all, so teams have just been steamrolling us on the ground. But with Syracuse, their offense is predicated on airing that thing out. They're going to throw it probably 40, 45-plus times in this game, and Kyle McCord has the ability to do so. It's no secret how Syracuse is going to try and win this game. So the defensive discipline in the secondary in particular, if you're bailing them out with DPI time after time after time, again, it just gives them that help that they don't need. And when you do that, you put your defense in a horrible spot. So the discipline, the execution, and getting off of the field cannot overstate how important those three things are in this game. Coming up next, we're going to get into Fan Friday, addressing our top comments of the week. This comes after a quick word from our sponsors. Our first Friday sponsor is Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics pre-alcohol prebiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. I know we've all had one or two of those. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night, drink responsibly, and then tomorrow you'll feel your best. So here's how to use it correctly. Step one, drink your pre-alcohol. For the best results, make pre-alcohol your first drink of the night. Step two, drink responsibly. Go out and have fun, but pace yourself, hydrate, and then get a good night's sleep. Step three, enjoy the next day. Wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on whatever life throws at you. Head on over to zbiotics.com slash locked on college to learn more and get 15% off of your first order. When you use Locked On College in all caps at checkout, Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee. If you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash locked on college and use the code locked on college. That's L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E at checkout for 15% off. Our second Friday sponsor is FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the very same page that you're placing all of your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place just your first $5 bet. The NC State spread is now down to 3.5 as an underdog. If you think State's going to cover it at home, Waste no more time. Head on over to FanDuel.com in order to get started. Middle portion of our Friday show. It's now time for Fan Friday, addressing our top comments of the week. Here we go. First one comes from Jason NCSU. He says, the wake loss is inexcusable. At what point do we transition to playing the younger guys? Or do we save their red shirts only to see them possibly transfer well Jason I think the time is literally right now because 
this team, as sad as it is to admit, they don't have much left to play for. Their goals off the table. You can't win 10 games unless you win out and then win a bowl game. I don't anticipate that happening. In fact, many people don't. Most people don't. So that goal off the table. Making it to the ACC championship game, that is also off the table. You're starting 0-2 in the ACC. You'd have to win out to even have probably like a sliver of a chance. And if that were to happen, there would have to be complete chaos in which somehow, some way, you end up in the title game. It's not going to happen. So the goals are off of the table. What I think NC State needs to do now is figure out what they have on their roster to then determine what where their priorities lie going into next season. It sucks that we're talking about next season and week seven, but that's where we're at right now. I would make sure that I know exactly what I have in all of my young talent to see if you can try and keep them here. Because otherwise, they're just going to hit the portal. It is so easy to just bolt when things get hard right now. You can't assume that any single player is going to be here next. Of course, you still want to win games here. Don't get lost with that. But I would I would want to make sure which young talent is the most important to conceptualize moving forward. I don't think you adjust the uh, red shirt situation at all. I think the guys that you planned on red shirting, if the guys in front of them are playing well enough, you red shirt them. If you feel like the guys that you're going to red shirt are playing what are if you felt like the guys that are that you were going to redshirt the starters and the two deep guys and maybe even the threes in front of them are playing poorly enough to replace them replace them point blank period yeah. uh, we're we're not at the point in the season of leaving anything in the chamber empty the clip give this season everything that you've got because the strategic planning for two three years down the road i mean sure but in the world of college football right now it's just too mercurial you don't know who's going to be here so play your best guys, play your best 11, and let the chips fall where they may from there. Second one comes from Mike Wimbro. He says, a major key to a successful screenplay is to sneak the intended receiver behind a group of blockers who sneak out in front of him. Our screen is unsuccessful because you are not going to sneak KC anywhere. So this is the comment I was referring to. It's an even better way of saying what I've been saying. Teams know what KC Concepcion can do. They know who he is. They know that he wears the jersey number 10. You can't hide him anywhere on the field because that's the number one guy that they're on the lookout for. And when they know that's coming and when they see him go in motion, they're instantly tipped off saying, okay, here comes KC. He's going to get the ball. And then they're right there at the line of scrimmage. Loss of two, loss of one, no gain. They know it's coming. You can't afford to just jam it to KC at the line of scrimmage and magically expect that things are going to change. You got to get a lot more creative than that because they know it's coming. Let me tell you something. I absolutely agree with this comment and I want to liken it to something. This is, you know, a screenplay requires some finesse, some a little trickeration going on there. And meanwhile, we're messing around and, and acting as if, you know, if if the Pink Panther were a real show and the Pink Panther were a real actual animate object it's sneaking around and every time it's going somewhere uh the t- or inspector jock clouseau could hear what would happen instantly hey wait it seems like the are somewhere around here about to steal something hey that's- get him yeah, yeah exactly exactly and that's what we have had happen with kc for far too long It's been defenses yelling, hey, get him. And time and time again, he's been tackled for loss because of that. Again, everywhere the KC goes, defenders are going with him, okay? Everywhere he goes, multiple sets of eyeballs are saying, where's 10? Where's 10? Oh, where's 10 going? Oh, is 10 going to the left? Okay, great. We're going to – is 10 going to the right? We're going to the right. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot just – well, we motioned him out. And it was an orbit motion, and he immediately darted back into the line of scrimmage to catch this screen. So it was different. No, it's not. It's still just a screen. It's still just bad. Next one comes from G.H. Morgan. They say, isn't this the same thing we were fussing about a year ago regarding the tight end and hybrid usage? I do believe so, except this year we have a bona fide stud. We're also never hearing Vereen's name either. So, yes, we talked about this earlier this week. Mind-boggling that Justin Jolie – has not been utilized more than he has been. Only touching the ball three to four times, it ain't going to cut it. He needs to be getting seven, eight, nine, 
or 10. He needs to have the most targets of anyone on the team moving forward until further notice. And it was interesting. Kenton learned that the tight ends coach is actually Robert and I, who's the offensive coordinator, which makes it even more frustrating that the tight end is not like the number one option in this offense. And if you want to take it a step further, our head coach, Dave Doran, played tight end in college. How is the tight end position when you have Justin Jolie playing that position, not your number one option? How? And then you want to talk about Juice Farine. I am shocked how little we've seen Juice Farine in two seasons. In fact, barely at all. I think last year he had maybe four catches. They all came in one game against Notre Dame. And then we really never saw him again. I don't know what's happening at practice with Juice Farine. I have no idea, but I'm shocked that he's not been able to get any snaps because this was a guy, believe it or not, I think he was even more highly rated as a freshman than KC was a year ago. And yet here we are, can't find him. I, I can't believe that he's been a non-factor so far. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? We are begging and pleading and wishing and hoping to use our tight ends. We have a one of the best in the country. And then with the Juice Marine situation, I don't want to speculate on anything. I don't know. I know that there was some ailment things going on there, and, and some, was sick, some, yeah, some along those lines. And it it has been it has been disappointing to not see Juice Marine out there more. I don't know the reasoning, so I don't want to speculate as to oh he has been out there because it's a you know whatever the case may be. I don't want to speculate, but I will say I agree. I would have loved to hear Juice Marine's name because. Watching him play in high school, I saw immediately he has the goods. He has what it takes to be a big time playmaker at the next level. So I anticipated that things were gonna, you know, kind of turn around and or not even turn around, but just that he would develop. But Devin, I'll tell you this. I believed in Devin Carter every year. Every year I said, This is his year. He's gonna break out this year. This is his year. If I gotta be that same way about Juice Marine, I'll be bullish on him. I'll be bullish on him because I believe as long as he Where's the red and white? We've got a chance to make that guy break out because he's a really special talent. And last one comes from D Dog. They say, I would love Kenton's thoughts on ranking state's wide receiver core talent wise and not touches wise. So Ooh. I did clarify, he's just asking for rankings of the talent of our wide receiving core. So, in the interest of time, we'll cut it to like, let's say, let's say like six. Give me your top six wide receivers. Oh, man, that's tough. All right. So, Pound for pound talent. So I'm I'm not doing potential. I'm not doing who I think will be the best in the future. I'm doing right now. Yes. And if we're sticking to just the receivers, I would say our most talented, most talented, not best football player, just most talented, Noah Rogers. Not saying he doesn't work hard. Not saying that. He just feels like the most talented. Like he was just, God gave him the most there. Noah Rogers would be one. KC would be a very, very close to. KC would be literally bumping heads right up against them at number two. I'm going to say something that many people are not going to like. I think one of the most underutilized parts of this offense has been Dakari Collins because I think that he's a he's a three that's slightly more distant from KC than KC is from Noah. But with that being said, Dakari is still – he's one of those ones, and I love me a big-body receiver. I love me a physical guy that can do all those things. Number four, Wesley Grimes. Number five, it's tough because we've seen so little of these guys. It, it really is tough because we've seen so little of these two. But I'm going to say pure talent, Terrell Anderson, number five, Keenan Jackson, number six. But, again, that's that's just pure talent who I believe wakes up and rolls out of bed and does the best and would not have to rely as much on – knowing the the subtleties and the ins and outs of doing of playing receiver to get over because Keenan Jackson to me right now I think he's one of our best four in terms of like he he understand he gets it he get when he runs routes he just gets how to get into defensive backs block blind spots in a major way which in and of itself is a talent but I think that that's a little different if you're talking about how talented a guy is but again, Keenan Jackson's at multiple plays where if a pass is on the money, he's going to bang his head on the goalpost. So, you know, I, that would be my top six because, again, special, special group. And by the way, that top six, I know that, you know, some folks are going to feel like, no, oh, you slided this player, whatever the case may be. 
this is no disrespect to anybody because after Jackson and Anderson, I think there's a lot of guys that are right there. I think there's a lot of guys that are right there, but those are the six that I'd love to see get the lion's share of the snaps at this moment. I go Noah Rogers. I think he's almost a clear cut one and we have been nowhere close to tapping his true potential. I have Noah Rogers at one. This is where it might get interesting for some folks. I think I have Terrell Anderson at two pure Mm. talent. And I know he's a freshman. We've only seen him in limited capacity. I think he could really be something. But so I have him at two. Then I have Wesley Grimes at three. I think that's another guy nowhere really close to tapping his potential. He can go get it. And I think we need to see a lot more of him here uh, in the near future. I have Casey at four. And some folks are going to be like, what the hell is he talking about? Casey's extremely talented. He was our best player all of last season on offense. However, I think in some ways he's a little bit limited, a little bit limited. I think the coaching staff is limiting him even more by not allowing him to get down the field, keeping him at the line of scrimmage. But pure talent, when you're talking about a wide receiver's pure talent, I'm thinking of guys that can stretch the field long. I'm thinking of guys that can go up and snatch a ball out of the air, making guys miss, breaking in and out of routes. It's I'm not at all saying that Casey's not one of the most talented guys on the team because he is, but pure wide receiver talent, I have him at four. Number five, then I go Dakari Collins. And then number six, I go Keenan Jackson. But Keenan Jackson, I agree with you, Kenton. I think he could be virtually anywhere on this list. He's another guy nowhere close to tapping in to what he can really do. And I was so glad to see him get in the end zone against Wake Forest. He's going to have a whole lot more of those in the red and white. Another young guy, he can just go up and get the ball. He can spread the field like very few freshmen can in the whole country. I'm telling you, if that guy sticks around the red and white for quite some time, you're going to see him get in the end zone way more than just one. His name's That's my be all thing. over the record books. This is a guy that was highly touted out of one of the better football programs and high school ranks of Weddington. They've had a ton of guys go massive D1 and get into the NFL. Keenan Jackson is one of the better wide receivers to ever play at that school. We're just now scratching the surface with what Keenan Jackson can do, so hoping for a whole lot more of him here uh, soon as well. So those are our top six, just pure talent for the wide receiving room. Would certainly love to hear y'all's thoughts in the comments as well. And coming up next to round out our Friday show, we're going to give our final pregame thoughts before we take on Syracuse on Saturday night. This comes after a quick word from our sponsors. Our third Friday sponsor is Robin Hood Gold. With Robin Hood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robin Hood Gold allows others to get the rates and perks usually reserved for the high society. Now, the resourceful individual with Robin Hood Gold can earn the very liberal rate of 4.5% APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with the handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Robinhood Gold provides the privileges of a high net worth for any net worth. These generous benefits are now available for just $5 a month. The new gold standard is here with Robinhood Gold. Sign up at Robinhood.com slash gold. Terms apply. For product-specific disclosures, visit Robinhood.com slash gold. Investing involves risk. Rates may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold, LLC. Last couple of minutes of our pregame show. Now just time to get into our final thoughts and predictions ahead of the Syracuse matchup. 8 p.m. in Carter-Finley Saturday night. We accomplished our worst fears and actually lost on the CW Network last week, so I wouldn't be surprised if they keep us off of there for a while. I still cannot believe we lost that game. But 8 p.m. ACC Network. It is the blackout game. Very excited to see what the new uniforms look like in Carter-Finley. But, Kenton, what are your final pregame thoughts here before they kick it off? Every game from this point on is winnable. Every game from this point on is losable. And I mean that very genuinely. Don't show up to this game with the thought of, hey, NC State is going to get taken out to the woodshed. This is truly a game where no outcome would surprise me. Truly. So NC State has a shot. They have a fighting chance because, again, the styles match up really well for NC State. But the question is, what does the execution look like? Because there have been plenty of times where we're in position where things are supposed to work out right, where things are, you know, we put ourselves in a really great position for everybody except two, three guys. And all of a sudden we're, we're in a bad way. So the biggest deal for this game to me 
is just execute. Now, I know that that sounds like a broad, wide catch-all, but I mean, in the moment of truth, it's you and LaQuinn Allen, one-on-one in open field, execute. And when you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, it's me and this Mike linebacker in the hole. I got to get him up out the hole so Jordan Waters or so Kendrick Raphael can get loose. Execute. It's about that execution in the moment of truth because that is what has been lacking sorely so far this season. What do you play for when all of your goals are off the table? The things that you set out to do this season are no longer attainable. How do you convince a team to go out and still give it 150% effort? You got to play for pride. You got to play for each other in that locker room. They didn't go through all of that to quit in the beginning of October. Play for the guys that you have gone through everything with. I want to see a team that has not given up on the rest of the season. Now, again, where we currently stand is extremely disappointing. There's really no two ways about that. However, you can't afford to quit now. If you quit now, it's going to get so, so much worse. Now, I don't believe the coaching staff is going to allow that to happen, but we're going to need to see something. This game is certainly by no means unwinnable. Syracuse is a flawed team. They have their flaws on defense. They're not perfect on offense either. They've thrown for a billion yards, but they've struggled at times to be able to do so. In a weird way, I kind of like this matchup defensively for NC State. The secondary is supposed to be one of the better units on this team. This is going to be their opportunity to prove themselves. I don't think they'll have to worry so much about Syracuse in the run game. However, me saying that, they might try and utilize it more because they they think we're going to sit back on our heels. We'll see how that goes. But defensively, I'll be very fascinated to see how NC State holds up against an extensive passing attack. And then offensively for the Wolfpack, same thing we've been asking for every single week. Open up the playbook, let CJ let it rip. Get it to Justin Jolie, spread the field with your wide receivers. No more screens, please. And then if you have that good position late in the game, don't let off of the gas pedal. Do not let teams like Syracuse linger around if you've held a lead for the majority of this game. They can beat you if you allow them the opportunity to do so. Killer instinct. Now, just real quickly, if you're into FanDuel, the line has actually dropped to three and a half. It was sitting at four and a half seemingly all week. So it seems as if people have a little bit of confidence that NC State has a shot in this one. Then if you're looking at the over-under at 54 and a half, I would anticipate Vegas is looking at a final score somewhere around like 29 to 26, somewhere in that ballpark. It could be much higher than that. But NC State, regardless, they have to play much better football than what we've seen so far. Just like last week, I'm going to do it again. I'm getting Justin Jolie in the end zone with an anytime touchdown. Do it for Granny. She needs it right now. We all do. That'll do it for us here for the week and here on Friday. As always, thank you all so much for joining us. Be sure to hit that like button. Drop your comments in the comment box. Tell us how you see this game going on Saturday night in Carter Finley. Anything else you have on your mind, drop that in the comment box as well. Mash that subscribe button if you have not already. And make sure to stay up late with us. It will be a late one. Post game live after the game Saturday evening. You might need a coffee to stay up with us that late because it's going to be the graveyard shift. But until then, enjoy your weekend. We'll see you Saturday night. Go Pack. Go Pack.